I should warn you, we have the ignominious distinction of being the last panel before lunch. Um, but my warning to you is that uh, even though we're the only thing standing between you and those styrofoam boxes out there, nobody leaves here until Neil says so. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, my two panelists here who uh, I'm very pleased to say have phonetically uh, anagrammed names, uh, Ellen Stofan and Neil Stephenson. Um, Ellen is chief scientist at NASA. Can anybody beat that in this room? <laughs> Serving as principal advisor to NASA Administrator Charles Bolden on the agent, well, I guess he could beat that, on the agency science programs and science-related strategic planning and investment. She has researched the geology of Venus, Mars, Saturn's moon Titan, and Earth, just to keep it local, and was a principal investigator on the Titan Mare Explorer proposed mission to send a floating lander to a sea on Titan. Neil Stevenson, who you've already met, Neil is the New York Times best-selling author of many books, including the three-volume historical epic, The Baroque Cycle and Snow Crash, which was named one of Time Magazine's top 100 all-time English best English language novels. Now, you have to tell me, did you read all the ones ahead of you just to see what you did wrong? <laughs> Maybe you can move up next time. Um, he is also, because we have to push the book, he is also the author of Atmosphere Incognita, a story in uh, the Hieroglyphs collection. The title of this panel is Lost in Space, How Should We Approach Our Future Frontier? Let me begin by asking this question. How should we approach our future frontier? Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, the um, um, uh, space is, is really expensive and, and, uh, and hard to get to, and, and it's a dangerous place to be. So um, you have to have some reason for wanting to go there. And, the space program I grew up was based on a kind of heroic uh, quest that was set by, by President Kennedy, which was a, sort of the, 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 the prototype of what we talk about when we refer to a, a hieroglyph in the sense of this book, meaning a thing that could be explained in one sentence, put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, that everyone could understand and that sounded really cool and that people were willing to, to get behind. Um, since then, uh, we haven't really had that. Um, once we, we got to um, the, the moon, there was kind of a sense of, of what do we do now? Uh, and um, for various reasons, we didn't uh, go where I had always been told we were going to go, which was to giant uh, orbiting space colonies and eventually to, to Mars. Um, and so there's a whole uh, generation of bitterly disappointed uh, uh, people from the the 60s uh, uh, who uh, who didn't get their uh, who never got their their trip to Mars. Um, so the first thing that I think we have to do is decide why we're doing it. Uh, we've got uh, fantastic programs going on with robot space probes uh, that are doing uh, unbelievable stuff, uh, uh, sending people into space. Uh, we don't seem to have a super compelling narrative behind that anymore. Uh, and, and so I, I kind of feel like the first step is deciding why we want to be there and what the goal is. Well, I guess, um, obviously, I'm going to respectfully um, disagree that we, we don't have a goal. Um, scientifically, obviously, as you say, robotically, we're pushing back the frontier. We're rewriting textbooks every day from the Kepler Space Telescope that in the last several years has discovered several thousand uh, candidate planets around other stars. Um, if that's not science fiction, you know, I don't know what it is, but now it's, it's science fact. Um, and we're going to follow on with the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, to actually start looking at the atmospheres of those planets around other stars, which is just unbelievably cool. If you take it to the next level and say, OK, how are we doing that in our own solar system? We're searching for life um, on Mars, hopefully sometime soon on Europa. And this is where I think we do have a clear goal for the human exploration program, and that is the president has stated he wants to see a human in the vicinity of Mars by the early 2030s. Why? Well, scientifically, I actually think it's going to take um, geologists like me, astrobiologists, down on the surface of Mars, cracking open rocks, um, throwing half of them over your shoulder, and finding the right rock that's going to really demonstrate to us 
that life evolved on Mars. And so I think at NASA, we feel like we have a clear goal. And the new part is we're trying to do it in a new way. Um, so I'll stop there. Well, no, don't. Feel free to duke it out, <laughs> because it's important here. I mean, the, the premise, for those of you who, who haven't read all the, the paraphernalia, the premise of this whole conference is that Neil was mouthing off about the fact that, that science fiction writers uh, ha haven't, have been falling down on the job. And Charles that, Crow was mouthing off about that. Oh, all right. Well, then, and, yeah. okay. He was, and, he was issuing a complaint to, to me. Well, yeah. let's, let's discuss that. And the fact that, that I mean, look at, look at science fiction from when we were young. Consider, for example, Planet of the Apes, which uh, was about, you know, ultimately about, an, well, it's a, it's a big Twilight Zone episode. Uh, where, which ends with, oh, it was Earth after all. And, and it's all about atomic holocaust and, and the future of civilization, whereas they do it now, uh, 50 years later almost, and it's about viruses and animal testing. So, you know, it's, it's substantially the same story, but, but, but science fiction is much more interested in internal things and not about sending 40-story uh, uh, buildings into space. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, 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 the vision of the, the Planet of the Apes era was, was that of the sort of, uh, the one that I was raised on, which is the sort of Collier's Magazine uh, uh, spreads uh, by Chesley Bonestell, in which there was a certain progression of uh, vehicles and things we were going to build that was going to start with great big huge rockets called the Nova boosters that were going to help us build uh, sort of donut-shaped uh, orbiting space colonies. And, and uh, eventually, we'd build vehicles big enough to take a substantial uh, a human presence uh, to, to Mars. Mars has always been sort of the obvious next place uh, that, that we're uh, expected to, to go. And the, um, uh, the um, you know, one vision of, of why to go there is is to do to do science, and in, in a lot of ways, that's kind of the, the most logical uh, reason to, to, to go to Mars uh, for all the reasons that, that you mentioned. Um, the, uh, the 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 vision that we hear from, say, Elon Musk is, I just want to go there. You know, just. Uh, I want to die on Mars. Just I think it's it, the, somehow the inherent kind of destiny of the human race to expand to, to other worlds, and that's all the justification that that I really need. Well, I think it's it's a great point, and I actually think science fiction is does such a great job of inspiring. You know, you I, I didn't say this, but you know, you can, you can't invent something that somebody didn't imagine first. Um, and we actually, our chief technologist, David Miller, um, has a little circular robot thing up on the space station called Spheres. And he actually invented it with his students at MIT after watching Star Wars and that little circular ball thing that Luke Skywalker trained with. We have one of those now up on the eye. Well, they don't do, they don't do uh, training on Sword it. fighting. Yeah. Um, with it. But it, again, that, that powerful um, role that I think imagination plays is, is something that's a critical role. And actually, there's, I just read about a month or so ago a new book called The Martian. Um, where a guy gets accidentally left behind on Mars by an expedition. Um, it's a fun book. So, you know, I think science fiction is still out there. And, and, and I love this idea of let's not just have dystopian, you, you know, as much as I love those stories as much as anyone, that imagining new ways of propulsion, that imagining new ways of exploring, new ways of doing spacecraft is something that, you know, some of those ideas are going to become the reality. They're going to make an engineer sit down and say, Oh, maybe I could actually do that. Somebody in this room must know what that floating ball was called, because I'm looking around <laughs> this crowd, and I'm seeing a lot of nerds. <laughs> <laughs> this is the closest I've come to Comic-Con. What is it? Remote. It's just called a remote? Yeah. That's not a good enough name. <laughs> Ow. Oh, we have a better name for it. What do you, what do you call it? Spheres. <laughs> My theory was that it was actually a pinata, and that had he hit it, all his candy would have fallen out. How does it? How does it move? Does it have like compressed, some kind of uh, rockets? I'm hoping it? Tom knows. Uh, oh, okay. I'm actually not sure. We uh, somebody in I, there's a lot of NASA people in the audience. So anybody? I don't know if anybody can help me out. CO2. Compressed CO2 there. CO2. Okay. So 
don't use don't use it too much or you'll asphyxiate. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about something uh, a seed you you also planted, Neil, this morning about about um, having sort of a centralized system or a method uh, for developing, generating, and making ideas happen. In the entertainment business, and, and all of you folks online, don't tell anybody this, but, but there's sort of this protocol. I will tell young writers, if you want to work in show business, you have to know who to go to go in and pitch an idea. But imagine you know, you're trying to pitch an idea to General Motors for a new car. It's very, very hard, right? Yeah. What, if, what if, you know, I've got an idea for the future. I've got an idea for the next version of, of rocket ships or, or, or robots or whatever. We, how do we make that happen? How do we develop that infrastructure? It's tough because uh, with, with other types of inventions, uh, particularly in the realm of software, you can make a pitch that will uh, appeal to, uh, to, to greed, frankly, to the, the desire of the uh, investor to, to make a bunch of money. Um, and, and so there's a well-trodden path that uh, entrepreneurs can use to get, uh, get funding. Uh, based on that. In the case of um, inventing a new propulsion system uh, for space travel, um, it's, it's a much harder uh, pitch to make because uh, it's, it's difficult to explain uh, uh, to a business person how they're going to get their money back. Uh, it almost uh, obliges, uh, unless there's something I'm not aware of, it almost ob obliges uh, somebody who's trying to innovate in that area to, 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 uh, to seek grants, uh, to do things through university labs or, or government labs of various kinds. We actually have a program at NASA called um, NIAC. It's a NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. And if you guys are ever short on ideas for stories, I'd go, I'd go look at some of the things we fund. Um, uh, spider web type platforms to get really large aperture telescopes, submarines on Titan, advanced um, propulsion systems. So, so we do actually, obviously, we're spending most of, of our NASA resources trying to get make sure the space station's operating, launching the 17 satellites we have studying the Earth. But we do put some money into what are, what are the things we want to do 25 years from now? What do we want to do 30 years from now? Let's put a little money into speculation, into innovation. And Tom talked earlier about the, the challenges and, and prizes in citizen science. And that's a, an area we're really expanding in to say, you know, we don't have all the good ideas. Let's, let's reach out as broadly as we can um, and get help. So th that begs the question, which I'm asked constantly. I'm sure you are too, Neil. So where do you get your ideas? <laughs> I think the, the stock answer is Schenectady. <laughs> I, I agree. Okay. Is that, is that where you're That's from? not a good enough answer, though. <laughs> yeah. um, well, do you, you mean ideas for, for fiction? Are we talking I'm about more fiction interested now? In her answer. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> yeah. but, but you I thought you were looking don't. at me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think the thing is, um, you know, earlier we were talking about the globalization of science. You know, first of all, I think if we're like working on a global exploration roadmap of how are we going to get humans to Mars, you know, we work with our, our global partners on, on how to do that. So first of all, we don't just look within the United States. We don't just look within the government. We just don't say, okay, all the good ideas are held within NASA or the federal government. We reach out. Um, and form partnerships with universities, with academia, and again, increasingly with people through citizen science, through um, you know, going out and saying, what ideas can we actually get huge public involvement in? And I think, I, I think we're actually changing the way we do things, which is a, another great example of that is commercial crew and commercial cargo saying, you know, if we're going to get to Mars in the future, the space program of the future is going to be much more a public-private um, than the entirely public uh, funded effort that we saw going to the moon. Where do you get your ideas, Neil? <laughs> yeah. and, ha and how do you, well, so, I mean, again, this comes back to your inspiration for this whole thing. So how do we, uh, as science fiction uh, writers, develop things that will, because here you have the chief scientist at NASA saying, we're interested. We're interested in hearing it. What, what, where do we get the ideas? Uh, I spent a while um, uh, trying to come up with new ideas for space launch, for the, how to get things off the ground and into low Earth orbit. Uh, and that was out of a conviction that 
what we've been doing all along, conventional chemical rockets uh, are uh, probably not the technology we would pick if we started from scratch and, and decided what was going to work best. And um, what I found out pretty quickly was that um, so many brilliant people have been thinking about that exact problem for so long that uh, it's almost a waste of time. Unless you have, uh, you're privy to some new physics uh, or some new materials science, uh, to, to try to invent any uh, novel kind of uh, space launch uh, technology because uh, you always end up learning that somebody came up with exactly that idea and 20 other cool ideas like 50 years ago and investigated it and, and wrote it all down. So there's an amazing zoo of different ideas. I found things like um, somebody had the idea to drill a two mile long slanted hole, a tunnel in the Antarctic ice cap and use it as a giant gun. Uh, and I mean, that's just you know, one example of, of many ideas that, that people have come up with. So the, I think uh, innovating in that, that part of it, which is only a small part of what a space business and a space ecosystem has to look like, is less uh, a problem of, of coming up with new ideas and, and more a, a problem of how do you, uh, how do you uh, push those ideas forward in a, a kind of aerospace uh, ecosystem where um, uh, we're, we're pretty much locked in on, on the, the chemical rocket approach that, uh, that has been the basis for all space travel until today. Are we seeing advances in, in alternative means of propulsion? We are. Uh, in fact, right now, NASA is putting a lot of effort into um, uh, what SEP, which is solar electric propulsion, ion propulsion. We've done some spacecraft to uh, different different targets with it, but it's actually we're developing a much larger ion engine um, to do an asteroid mission uh, because we think that's the most useful uh, technology that we have at this point in time, say, to move cargo back and forth to Mars because if you're going to have humans on Mars, you're going to have to take a lot of stuff um, for them. And so ion propulsion is sort of the next step. We certainly have looked over the years, as many people have, at, at nuclear thermal propulsion. But that sort of next big step is something that's still, it's, as Neil says, it's a huge challenge. Everybody has said, you know, we've got to move beyond chemical propulsion, but it's really hard. Physics is, is tough. I thought so in college, and I think so now. So where do you want to go in space? I mean, it, it, it sounds like Mars just isn't that big a deal anymore. I don't think I said that. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, the, the, the problem with space is you've got to have gravity or your body falls apart, uh, and you've got to get away from cosmic radiation. So it's actually a pretty rough environment. And um, so the so two ways to do that are you can go to a large planet and dig in, which is kind of what you would be doing in the case of Mars, or you can use in situ uh, resources like asteroids to build things that rotate to give you simulated gravity and then construct shielding uh, around your living quarters so you don't get just baked by, by cosmic radiation. So those are kind of the, the two options. And in a lot of ways, the building a habitat is sort of more logical because there's plenty of stuff up there. There's plenty of, of material in Earth-like orbits that could be gone up and grabbed. Uh, and um, uh, and you can build whatever environment you, you please in that case. Um, but uh, it lacks the certain kind of romantic element of being able to go to another planet and go places where people haven't gone before and you know, perhaps be confronted with surprises. There's not going to be a lot of surprises uh, on a, a rotating space habitat. Are we, are we looking at colonization in the... In the in our lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime? You know, I, our, our aim right now is to get humans to Mars and, as Elon Musk says, to get them safely home again if they so choose. So, you know, our focus is really that. How do you get humans safely there? How can we make sure with the space radiation and other issues that we can get them there safely um, a, a, and get them home again? And, and we can do it by the 2030s. I mean, we're really on a path, and I think we can achieve it. I think where this community is really helpful is, um, you know, is this is is this something that you think engages the public? I mean, how many of you would want to go to Mars? Takers. Get back. <laughs> as long as you can come back. Yeah. 
you know, and at times, sometimes when I'm talking to people in the general public, because I think science fiction has done such a good job, because CGI has done such a good job, I actually find some confusion in the public about whether we've actually been to Mars or not, which is <laughs> horribly disappointing, you know, from my point of view. And, and so I, I think that this community serves a great role, because you guys are probably more maybe enthusiastic about getting humans to Mars than your average person on the street. Um, in talking about it, in, in talking about why it's exciting, why it's exciting to explore, to move beyond this planet, to move out into the solar system, and someday beyond. When you say we have been to Mars, I mean, we haven't been to the moon, but we've been to the moon. So there's, there's yes. that distinction as well. Um, one of the early problems we had on Futurama was not only, you know, we could just magically terraform and, and assume there were aliens and, and all kinds of other life forms in space, but the, dif the chief difficulty we had, because we were so you know, compulsive, was the speed of light is a real hard thing to <laughs> defy, and how we could get anywhere, in, even in the galaxy, within a reasonable period of time. So we just made this rule that in 2045, the speed of light had been changed. So, which, which, which we can do. Can you? So far, we don't think so. Uh, we, we have found no good evidence that you can exceed the speed of light. So that, that is a limiting factor. Um, and that is the frustration, you know, as again, it, it's within our grasp, within our lifetimes, I think, to ultimately, we need really large aperture telescopes. But this idea of being able to start imaging planets around other stars um, is one that I think is so exciting, one I think we're going to see. Um, and the first thing we're going to want to do is go there, but they're obviously really far away. So what do you want to see happen? Um, the Lunch? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no. Blood sugar. This panel to end. No, no, the... Um, um, I'm still stuck on the kind of uh, the, the more Elon Musk style of heroic space epic. You know, that's what, you know, just go go to space because it's what we ought to do, and and um, uh, just because it would be cool. It's kind of a uh, almost an adolescent uh, kind of impulse, uh, but um, I think uh, uh, that's the. Uh, th those are the arguments that, that sound most most compelling to me, and and usually what happens then is then there's some backfilling. So I say, well, because if there was a horrible plague on Earth and everyone died, then um, we would have another planet, you know. Uh, but so so there's always sort of some 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 rationalizations that are backfilled in for the sort of go big. Uh, mentality about about space exploration but why why isn't manifest destiny enough <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying it is you for think me. It is, yeah right? yeah but but yeah well I think for a lot of people it's just not I mean a lot of people say well why don't you invest that money in something else why don't you invest that money here on earth and that's why I think manifest destiny or however you want to say it's our nature to explore um, we push boundaries as a species as a species by nature is part of the justification. There is scientific justification. Um, and of course, then there's the justification. My favorite Onion article ever was one where they said NASA has been launching billions of dollars into space, and they show these you know, rocket ships <laughs> going off, loaded with dollars trailing behind them. You know, we spend all this money here on Earth. These are great STEM jobs. You know, they are, we invest in the best sectors of the economy um, that help grow this country, help grow economies across the world. So. There is that economic piece that you know we don't always talk about, but but is there? You know, this is a great um, you know investment for innovation that I think is also important. And the great concern is when NASA isn't launching that money. What what are you doing when you're not launching money into space? I mean, you know, we're, we're innovating, we're exploring, we're discovering. We have six people above us, you know, right now on the International Space Station doing amazing research. That they're, they're that watching us, us now back here on Earth. <laughs> Yeah, a minute ago on my phone, I pulled up the live stream feed. You know, how cool is that, that on your cell phone, you can sit there and watch what the astronauts are seeing from space um, down here on Earth. You know, we're achieving 
amazing things. And the problem is sometimes I think the public is just kind of, um, you know, they see it every day and it's routine. You know, to me, it's never routine. You get to look at the surface of another planet for the first time. Um, you watch a launch. I watched the SpaceX launch a couple weeks ago, um, sending new cargo up to the ISS. You know, we do, as not we at NASA, we as a, a country, we as a civilization do amazing, cool things. Um, and it's really fun to be part of it. Um, we can start taking questions, or we can just answer all of Ms. Singh's questions now, if, <laughs> if, uh, if we have time for that. Yes, sir. I hate to be a party pooper. I know you, you've said you don't want us to be negative, but when the space shuttle program was being initiated, they were saying, I believe, $100 a pound to put stuff into low Earth orbit. Uh, by the time it was done, I've heard figures that said it was a half billion dollars a launch. Is, isn't that the real killer for space exploration, is low Earth orbit, the, the thing that you wrote about? And how, how do you think that's going to work out with with initiatives like like uh, Mr. Musk's, um, it it's certainly a big it's it's a big hurdle, obviously, and and that's why the interest in in considering other uh, other ways of, of doing it. There's there's a lot that could be said and has been said about the the politics uh, of the space shuttle and how it came to be in the form that it it ended up in. Uh, and, and how that may have driven its cost upwards in a way its uh, original uh, planners uh, didn't uh, didn't anticipate. Um, so the one of the basic issues we're never going to get away with, I think, get away from in 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 launch cost reduction is 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 that it's all entwined with with politics and with with money in a way that's uh, it's very hard to to separate out. If I can jump to one of Ms. Singh's questions. Oh, right. <laughs> um, I think the issue of, of how we work with other countries in the world is really critical. And last week, I had the great fortune to be able to go up to New York City, where we were announcing the president had put forward a bunch of initiatives um, for uh, the big UN climate summit. One of those was NASA was releasing really high resolution um, topographic elevation data over most of the continent of Africa. Um, and that data are critical, but we're not just um, throwing it over the transom and saying, here, world, good luck with this, this elevation data. We actually have a group called Servere that we do with USAID, um, where we go into countries. This year, it's going to be East Africa, South Africa. And we, we take those data sets and we say, OK, here's elevation data that can help you in your local region help to make better decisions. When your sea level is rising, when you're going to get storm surges in areas, what are you going to be able to, how are you going to use this data to make decisions that are going to affect people's lives, affect their economies. And so um, in the government, we're trying to make especially climate data much more widely available around the world, but not just saying to a country, here's the data, but here's how to use it. Here's how you can use it um, to make those hard decisions that are going to have to be made. In the back. I'm kind of wondering about uh, space tourism or uh, kind of the functional equivalent in space of ecotourism. It seemed to me many stories in the book talked about uh, wealthy people willing to drink in the first space bar or this the, the, to go on an eco-tourist venture that, that foreshadowed uh, Habs in space or on the moon. And so I'm wondering whether or not uh, space tourism has a, uh, an opportunity to kind of both finance and bootstrap renewed space program. And I'm wondering if we can use that to send people like Chris Hadfield to sing David Bowie from the space station or any of the other things. Because it, doesn't, it seems to me uh, you pull a country together. I mean, I, I was brought to tears personally listening to him <laughs> sing David Bowie. Yeah. And, the, and this is uh, flying down below me. So uh, I guess that's my question. Uh, where is space tourism on the horizon? You know, I've watched that video 12 times, and I'm a crier, and I, I cried also. I thought it was beautiful. Um, you know, we're entering into a new realm at NASA. It's a really exciting time to be there with the sort of partnering with the commercial sector, with going to commercial cargo for the ISS, going to commercial crew. Um, and, and, you know, part of it was commercial crew. You know, we had three companies really vying for, for this. Um, two were selected, as has been talked about earlier. Um, we're going to a new realm. You know, by the 2020s, are there going to be commercial um, outposts in low Earth orbit. Um, 
will NASA just be a customer instead of the primary um, customer along with the other space agencies of the world? And I think what's going to happen over the next 10 years is going to be fascinating as we move to, despite the costs of getting, of getting material off the Earth and even just to low Earth orbit, the commercial sector wants to play, small companies, big companies, innovators. It's a changing world, and I think it's really exciting. And again, that's where you guys come in, because it's not clear to me where it's all going. Um, I don't think it's clear to anybody at this point, but it's clear that, that we're going towards commercial low Earth orbit. What it's going to look like, say, by 2025, 2030, I think is really an open question. Uh, two words, Disney moon. <laughs> once, once they put a park up there, people will go. I mean, who, who went to Orlando before? <laughs> okay, yes. Actually, you've had a question, sir. Uh, she, she hasn't. I agree that it's an exciting time for the commercial elements to work as part of, you know, in D.C. we call that part of the you know, National Defense Industrial Base. Uh, there's a growing number of people and organizations that are part of that. But Neil made a point earlier this morning as well, which is that commercial interests are not identical to public interests. Um, unfortunately, there's also then this sort of resource constraint for innovation at the shortage. I think it's really interesting to think about whether the shortage is on clever ideas or whether it's about the infrastructure to actually launch, literally or figuratively, those new ideas. Uh, how do we think about how the small profit-driven or large profit-driven commercial side should intersect with the government requirements or public needs, whether that's of space exploration, um, of other kinds of uh, technical and technological innovation in a way that, as Dan Kaufman this morning talked about, pushes that public sector, sector interest but benefits from the commercial side. The government has a few challenges in terms of procurement and other uh, moving fast uh, in a way that it didn't in the 1960s. And so how do we balance the, all those different constraints and opportunities? Well, just a quick answer then I'll let Neil talk about it. You know, we, we struggle with that every day at NASA because you say, how do you, how do you get the commercial sector involved? How do, you, how do you energize them about the potential of low Earth orbit? We have a group called um, CASIS that's affiliated with NASA um, that runs um, the National Laboratory up on the International Space Station that's looking for ways to commercialize research. They have now sent their second group of, uh, of commercial uh, research uh, experiments up to the space station, including just last week with the 3D printer uh, and some other experiments that they sent up. Um, so we're, we're moving into that realm, but I, I think we're doing it kind of step by step and, and trying to figure out. It's a complex question. Um, are, are we up and down mass limited? Yes. Are we resource limited? Um, the resources are what they are, um, and, and you do what you can, and you try to innovate as you go along. I think there's a massive interaction with government that starts to happen as soon as you, a, a, a private company starts to do anything related to space. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to build a, a rocket, um, you've, you're, you're dealing with all kinds of regulatory issues around the fact that you've got this big piece of fire-breathing stuff that's going to go over a lot of other people's property. Uh, and so there's uh, certain standards you have to obey around that. And, and what those tend to, to lead to is that you're, you're probably going to end up launching from uh, an existing government launch facility. Um, there's also uh, sort of arms uh, control uh, regulations that, that kick in uh, if, you're, if you're building anything that can be defined as, as part of, uh, of uh, as part of a weapon, then it limits uh, who's allowed to, to get access, who you can talk to about, about, your, about your, your, your project. And so a lot of these people have to deal with kind of complicated uh, problems around um, restricting access to, uh, to information uh, to U.S. nationals or people who are on approved lists. So there's, there's massive interaction that happens. Uh, in, in a way, space is, is like may, maybe not a great example of, uh, of an area where we can do free innovation simply because of these existing factors that, uh, that it, it's always going to be a sort of co-production of, uh, of, of government of, and, uh, and private, private industry. Tell the, tell the anecdote, I think it's your anecdote, about the, the best thing, communism. <coughs> Oh, just I, I uh, uh, 
I once knew a, a sort of grizzled NASA uh, engineer from the Apollo days who said that um, the, the Apollo moon landings were communism's greatest achievement. <laughs> Just in the sense that uh, you know the whole reason to go there was to get there before the the communists did, and it, it took on elements of a kind of statist uh, you know propaganda project uh, while we were doing it. So there needs to be market propaganda as well in order to get uh, whatever. I mean, is there inspiration like that out there today? Or well, again, I think if you, if you look at, at what it would take in the absence of a Cold War to motivate a country um, to do something ambitious like sending humans to another, another planet, another moon. Um, you need a motivation. And, and I think we've talked about kind of the motivation to do it from a, you know, from a human perspective. But I, I think to say practically, how can we do it? And again, I go back to this public-private partnership. You know, the US did it on its own. Um, for the, going to the moon. We won't do it on our own to go to Mars. It's going to be an international effort, and I think it's not just going to be governments. It's going to be public-private partnerships, and I think that's exciting because that's where we're going to get innovation, we're going to get new ideas, we're going to get great ideas. Yes, sir. We can put a man on the moon, but can we get a microphone to that corner of the room? First of all, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic panel. Um, but what I wanted to ask is how you as an author and you as a scientist try to enlist younger people into this process of thinking about science and thinking about space exploration. It seems like today in literature, there has been a migration towards the mystical. You have vampires and wizards and uh, werewolves. And so how do we poach some of those zombies, younger... don't forget zombies. Zombies, exactly. So how do we poach some of these people back for science? Well, I'll, I'll give a, a quick answer, uh, which is also a self-serving answer, which is that I have a big near-Earth space opera hard science fiction novel coming out in May called Seven Eves, which uh, is it's almost exactly me addressing your, your question, which is, why is it that uh, in the, the, the sort of fantasy and science fiction world, the needle has swung way over toward fantasy in the last decade or two? Um, so this is uh, an experiment to see if I can swing it back the other way a little bit. I think there's a couple things. First of all, the you know the president has a big initi initiative on STEM education. How do we get how do we get better science teachers? How do we make sure we're teaching kids science in a way a hands-on experience that's fun and exciting? I try to get out into classrooms just about once a month because to me to go out and, and talk to fifth graders or junior high school or high school kids and and try to get them enthusiastic. You figure if you make one convert, you know I've done my job. Um, but the other thing where I think we have a lot of work to do, frankly, is, again, a question that was asked earlier in underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I'm frequently one of the few women um, in, in a room um, when the topic is science and engineering, and, and that's frustrating because we're not going to solve big problems like how to deal with climate change, uh, how to get a lot of mass through that thin atmosphere and down onto the surface of Mars unless we have all of our population participating. And so I think it's a huge challenge still uh, that we're working on. And there's probably an anti-intellectualism that's permeating, an anti-science that's permeating our discourse beyond just this uh, subject in, in, uh, in, in, on, on the planet currently. Well, let's talk about your inspirations. What did you read? What did you watch? What, what, why did you become a scientist? You know, I have a particularly weird, my father worked for NASA. I'm actually a NASA brat. I went to my first launch when I was four. Um, I went to the Viking, this dates me terribly. I went to the Viking launches and met Carl Sagan and, um, you know, all the people who put, the Vi who put Viking on Mars. And so, to me, NASA was something I grew up with. But it was that inspiration of seeing, seeing people go to the moon. I, on the other hand, I was off reading Dune in a corner. Um, you know, I was hugely inspired um, by science fiction. And so, to me, it was that combination of, reality, we have, we have people on the moon, and also reading about science fiction. It's the fact and the fiction, and you need both, I think. No. How about you? Um, I'm just sitting on the rug in front of the big black and white TV watching the, the Mercury uh, and Gemini missions. You know, I mean, that was it. And who are your, who are your fictional 
Um, you know, the, the usual suspects from that era, but for whatever reason, uh, the one that sticks with me is, is Heinlein. So I read all that stuff, but he had a knack for creating uh, little moments, little conversations or little interactions between people that, uh, that have stuck with me and I have very clearly lodged in my head all these years later. There's one in particular that just burns me up. I get mad whenever I, I, I got angry when I read it as a kid, uh, and, and uh, I, my blood pressure still goes up whenever I uh, remember this. You, you want to know what it was? Yes, we do. Okay. It's, the one, it's the one where the, the... I'm afraid we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one where the, the high school group goes through a teleportation tube to another planet for their like, summer vacation or their, their, you know, their weekend away. And then it breaks down, and so they get stuck there. They get marooned on this other planet for, for a while. And it's years before the Earth people can, can get back to them. And um, so finally, uh, the rescue party comes, and there's a TV crew. And so this guy is going to be the spokesman for these people who've survived on this, this planet. And just before he goes on the air, the reporter uh, walks up to him and touches his face, and he, he doesn't quite know what's going on, but he does the interview. And then later on, he, 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 he realizes that they put war paint on him. Because the story they wanted to tell on the TV interview was that these people had reverted to savagery. Uh, and, uh, and so they just like, whoosh, just, you know, put war paint on him before he could react and did the interview uh, on that basis. It just makes me so mad. <laughs> you know? so, so Heinlein had a genius for creating moments like that, is all I'm saying, as a writer that sold the, the technological content of, of the, the story um, better than, than the other guys. We have time for one final question, and it will be mine. Um, <laughs> Which is the better future? Or which is the future you expect? Star Trek, Star Wars. <laughs> oh, good heavens. No, you must choose. I, I have to say Star Trek. You know, again, that probably dates me, the original, the original series. Um, <laughs> you know, again, to me, since, you know, I, I'm too chicken to ever actually go explore myself. So I get to explore the surface of a Titan every time Cassini sends back new data. I get to explore Mars every time we get new images from Curiosity. So the idea of having this group out just exploring, to me, is, is perfection. Well, Trek is science fiction, and Wars is, is fantasy. You know, I, see, I see Wars as the camel's nose under the, the, the tent that created the swing I was talking about earlier. Uh, and so um, it's almost, for me, a self-answering. Yes, the correct answer is Star Trek. <laughs> yes. Star Trek is the future. Star Wars is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. What relevance does that have to us today? Thank you all. You may now dine. Yeah, thanks.